The Federal Reserve cannot treat inflation alone. Economic and financial reforms are needed to convince the world that the United States will pay its debts. Current inflation has been fueled by fiscal policy. The government has printed or borrowed nearly $5 trillion and sent checks to people and businesses. The U.S. previously borrowed and spent without causing inflation. People kept the extra debt a good investment. The fact that this stimulus leads to inflation reflects a broader loss of belief that the United States will repay its debt. The Federal Reserve's monetary policy tools to cure this inflation are blind. By raising interest rates, the Fed is pushing the economy into recession. He hopes to push hard enough to offset the stimulus financial boost. But monetary breaks and a floor-based financial accelerator take a toll on the economic engine. Raising interest rates can lower stock and bond prices and raise borrowing costs, reducing home construction, car purchases, and corporate investment. The Fed can cut off the flow of credit. But higher interest rates don't do much to deter people from spending government stimulus checks. At best, the economy is unstable. The economy needs investment and housing. Today's demand is tomorrow's supply. Slowing the economy is not guaranteed to reduce inflation permanently. Even in the 2008 recession, when unemployment was over 8%, core inflation fell from 2.4% in December 2007 to just 0.6% in October 2010 and then returned to 2.3% in December 2011. 2022 core inflation will experience a depressing recession. In 1970 and 1974 the Fed raised interest rates faster and more sharply than today, raising interest rates from 4% to 9% in 1970 and from 3.5% to 13% in 1974. Each increase created a painful recession. Each of them lowered inflation. Each time, inflation roared back. The Phillips curve, which the Fed believes slowing economic activity reduces inflation, is temporary. Some recessions and rate hikes have higher inflation, especially in countries with financial problems. The Fed will face fiscal headwinds. The Biden administration and Congress will want to respond to the recession with more stimulus and another financial recovery that will only lead to more inflation. Without the expected stimulus and bailout, a recession would indeed be severe. Higher interest rates will add to the interest costs on debt, making direct deficits worse. It was hard enough to keep inflation down in 1980, when the federal debt was less than 25% of gross domestic product. It's now over 100%. Every percentage point higher interest rate means that there is $250 billion more in the inflationary deficit. Many governments, including the United States under the Biden administration, want to address inflation by borrowing and printing more money to help people pay their bills. This will only make things worse. The witch hunt for greed, monopoly, and profiteers will not leave a mark on inflation as it has for centuries. Price controls or political pressure to cut prices will create long queues and increase supply chain complexity. The endless excuses that the dog ate my homework, talk about Putin's hike, and transparently stupid ideas like a gas tax holiday do nothing but convince people that the government has no idea what it's doing. Monetary policy alone cannot improve sustained inflation. The government will also have to solve the underlying financial problem. Short-term deficit reduction, interim measures, or accounting tricks won't work. Nor will there be a period of high tax, austerity, killing growth. The U.S. should convince people that over the long run of several decades it will revert to its tradition of small primary surpluses that gradually repay debt. This outcome requires economic growth that increases long-term taxable income. Raising tax rates alone is like climbing a dune, as every increase hurt revenue growth. The U.S. also needs spending reform, especially on rights. And it needs to break the cycle where every crisis is met with a river of printed or borrowed money, bailouts for big financial firms, and stimulus checks for voters. The good news is that when there is joint fiscal, monetary, and economic reform, inflation can come to an end quickly and without an annoying recession. New Zealand, Israel, Canada, and Sweden inflation targets adopted in the early 1990s are good examples. These included profound financial and economic reforms. The abrupt end of the German and Austrian hyperinflations in the 1920s, when financial problems were resolved, are more dramatic examples. In the US, tax, spending, and regulatory reforms followed swiftly after the tight money in the early 1980s. Higher economic growth produced large fiscal surpluses in the late 1990s. Without these reforms, monetary tightening would still have failed. Had these reforms come sooner, the fall in inflation would have been painless economically.